Uh, good afternoon. Hope that you all have had a great summer. Uh, we are here today to give you some ideas for how to plan a great rest of your year, another year. Uh, we're going to start with talking about science instruction. In another presentation, I'll be talking to you about kind of the philosophy of science instruction in a classical school. Uh, but this uh, portion is going to be talking more about what does good science instruction look like in the classroom? Kind of keeping some of those philosophical principles in mind, again, in a different presentations, but then what does that look like in practice? So um, before we start with that, let's just talk about kind of what does the K-12 science scope and sequence look like um, in your school? Um, in grades K through eight, most of the sequence or much of the sequence is based on uh, the core knowledge sequence, which I know some of you are familiar with, but we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like. And then the high school sequence um, really looks a lot like what, you've, what you might find in um, a regular public school or private school, um, but it's about how we teach it. That sets us apart a little bit um, from other schools. So that looks like a ninth grade biology course and a 10th grade chemistry course. And then in 11th grade, maybe giving students the option of physics or giving them an elective course. And then in 12th grade, maybe another elective. We really highly recommend four years of science um, in a high school and the requirement of biology and chemistry. Um, we'll talk about where physics kind of fits in, um, but in many schools that might be a requirement or it might be an option for students based on their math ability. Some of the electives that students can look forward to, a couple of examples that uh, many of the Barney Charter schools have done are anatomy and physiology, um, a history of science course in the 12th grade, zoology, astronomy, and oftentimes many of the AP courses in biology, chemistry, or physics, or another kind of second year college level course. So let's uh, focus a little bit more on um, K through eight because in those grade levels, there's a smattering of topics essentially that's in every single grade. So as you'll see um, displayed for you, Several different topics are taught in many different grade levels, and I've kind of divided them up by life science topics, kind of chemical, physical science topics, and earth science. So for example, human biology topics are taught in nearly every single grade level. So as a third grade teacher, you don't have this pressure that you have to teach the whole human body that year. You'll have some particular human body topics to focus on, um, and then it will spiral upon itself in future grade levels. Um, You'll also notice that students are getting introduced to some really rich content at an early age. So um, students are learning about motion and forces, for example, through simple machines as early as second grade. Now they don't have to learn about all of the equations and the math that governs those principles and that will be revisited again in, in eighth grade. So let's talk about the uh, seven principles essentially that um, I have for great instruction in a science class. So things that teachers um, can be doing to, to deliver a great lesson. Um, these are cultivating wonder and an appreciation for the natural and physical world, teaching science as a story, um, requiring the mastery of vocabulary and processes, models, laws, and theories and equations that kind of govern our scientific understanding, incorporating science biographies, requiring clear, concise, and thorough explanations of the students, performing demonstrations and conducting labs, or doing other teacher-led activities that supplement the lessons that you're already delivering as a teacher, and finally, asking excellent questions to help the students make connections. So we'll spend a little bit of time on each of those. And what I'll do is use a fifth grade topics, kind of be a little bit in the middle of the different grade levels to illustrate some of these principles. So that fifth grade content I'm going to focus on are cells. So in the fifth grade, students are asked to know and understand the structure and function of the many different parts of the cell. And so the first principle, cultivating wonder, could be done with elementary students um, in a couple of different ways. Projecting images or giving students images of cells and not telling them that that's a cell, giving them an electron micrograph or an image from under a microscope and just asking them, what do you think this is? 
and then through further questioning try to get students to get to the point of the fact that it's a cell. Um, maybe it's performing a demonstration. This is a little bit trickier with more life science topics like the cell, but maybe you're doing a chemical example such as um, introducing uh, physical change versus chemical change and you just mix up some solutions in front of your classroom or add pepper to water and salt to water and ask students to tell you what happened and maybe give an explanation of why that was. Finally, especially elementary students love just fun, fascinating facts. And oftentimes, the grosser, the better. So you might introduce um, cells to students this way. Did you know that you have 37.2 trillion cells, and each of those cells has a different job? And they might get really, you know, think that's cool or maybe not. But then you could say, did you know you lose 30,000 to 40,000 skin cells per day. Ugh. That's nine pounds of cells that you lose every single year. How's that for some weight loss? So get them excited about what they're learning um, by giving them some kind of fun, fun facts about the world around them. Um, the second idea is to teach science as a story. So when I mention parts of the cell or organelles, these are things like the cytoplasm and the cell membrane and the nucleus and the lysosome. How many of you remember learning those in school? How many of you remember, them, remember learning them in a very boring, flat way? Maybe the teacher just said, we're going to talk about the parts of the cell. First, we have the cytoplasm. Everybody say cytoplasm, cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is the gel-like structure that holds all the organelles together. And then maybe that definition is put on the board, you copy it down, and then you move on. And the teacher will say, we have another word that begins with C. Now we need to keep these separate. This is called the cell membrane. And then you're given the definition of the cell membrane. But oftentimes for students to understand especially new words and topics in science that are unfamiliar to them, it's helpful to teach it as a story. So the organelles inside of a cell are organized with particular structures and functions. So you might start out with how, and start out explaining to them how things move throughout the cell and introduce the parts of the cell that way. So you might start out with something like the nucleus because the nucleus is the control center of the cell. And then ask students, what do you think I mean by control center? What's a control center? And students will eventually get to the point that it has the instructions for what the cell should do. And some students might even know that that means DNA. And so we will start essentially with what, how the cell knows what it needs to do. We'd have an image maybe projected for them that points out where the nucleus is located. Then we might move on to something like the ribosome, asking students the, or telling students the ribosome's job is to make proteins. The ribosome looks like on your picture these small tiny dots that are located throughout the cell. Um, everybody say ribosome makes proteins and get that definition kind of squared in their head. Then you might ask students to, to see that the ribosomes are also located on this structure right outside of the nucleus called the endoplasmic reticulum, which they'll like to say because it's kind of fun. And so ribosomes are located on the endoplasmic reticulum. So if ribosomes make proteins and the endoplasmic reticulum has ribosomes on it, what do you think the job of the endoplasmic reticulum is? And they'll get to the fact that it also makes proteins. Why do you think it needs to be very, very close to that control center, the nucleus? Well, because the nucleus needs to tell the endoplasmic reticulum how many and what type of proteins to make. Now that was a very quick overview and you would spend a lot more time on that, but you could work with students on essentially making proteins and then moving on to the other parts of the cell whose job is essentially to repackage the proteins and send them off to different parts. So we're starting at the center of the cell with the nucleus, moving to the endoplasmic reticulum, then going on to things like the lysosomes and the vacuoles and the Golgi apparatus, which move those protein packages around and then out the cell membrane and out the cell wall. And so then students have put together essentially characters in a story of how things move throughout the cell. <laughs>
Um, the next uh, concept or principle that I would emphasize is mastery of vocabulary and key concepts and equations inside of a science class. So um, this is, as was mentioned, this sequence is extremely content rich. So for something like this fifth grade example, you have all of those different weird funky names of the cell. Um, there will also be some chemical concepts in which students have to understand some weird names of things on the periodic table or understand um, basic equations or how something works. And so this is done, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, but through your um, engagement and questioning of students with the class. You want them to get really key um, definitions down for you um, as a teacher. You might be concerned about how do I take this really rich content and pare it down to the student's level. And this is where some of the resources that you have at your disposal um, come into play. Um, the first place that I would recommend that teachers go to is their core knowledge teacher handbooks. Um, these are in grades K through 5, and there are definitions in the science sections that are written at the grade level for that student. So you don't have to look up something like the Golgi apparatus in a high school biology textbook and then pare that down to an elementary grade level. So the first go-to place for finding good definitions is that core knowledge teacher handbook. Then, depending on your grade level, your students have textbooks and you have a teacher's edition that give you some vocabulary, again, at their level. In third and fourth grade, these are the Delta Science content readers. And in fifth through seventh grade, and sometimes also eighth grade, the titles come from the Prentice Hall Science Explorer series. And then in eighth grade, um, your school may choose to use something like a high school physics book named Conceptual Physics. But these are your, your guides, your go-tos on what kind of vocabulary, what kind of concepts and models and theories you should require the students um, to emphasize. Again, I just remind you that these topics spiral upon themselves and they're going to be hit on year after year. So just take a peek at which grade levels are going to have these again and take the pressure off of yourself that you have to get them mastered completely in your grade level. You're laying these really foundational blocks for vocabulary and concepts that will be repeated year after year. The fourth aspect of a really great science lesson is incorporating the science biographies. This is a really exciting part of our scope and sequence for science, and I think it's one that you'll really enjoy. Um, we have incorporated anywhere from four to six science scientists in each grade level. There are other schools that do this, but oftentimes the scientists are taught at the very end of the school year in their own unit. What we have done and what we recommend is putting the scientist into the unit in which they are relevant so that students can really get this full story of that scientific concept. There's a human aspect that gets pulled into it, there's another story that gets pulled into it, and students can really fully, more fully understand the process of science from a human perspective. Um, and so the scientists are listed um, in, your, in your scope and sequence exactly where they should be with the concepts that they have. You also have several resources in, at your disposal to teach these scientists. And this is an area where you should feel a lot of freedom on how you want to teach these scientists. Maybe you want to do a read aloud. And maybe you want to do a couple of different read alouds with your elementary students. Maybe you want to give a little bit of a lecture and then you want to model or recreate the experiment that that um, scientist did at more of an elementary level. You could spend one day on a scientist, you could spend a whole week on a scientist. Again, the resources that we'd recommend for pulling um, information for these scientists are the Core Knowledge Teacher Handbooks, what your whatever grader, third grader, fourth grader needs to know. Um, and then we also have listed in the scope and sequence several other resources that you can use however you'd like for the science biographies. So again, going back to that, that fifth grade example of, of cells, a couple of scientists that might be talked about are people like 
Robert Hooke, who's the person who actually coined the word cells. And you could tell the students the story of how he came up with that word. And that's because he looked at a piece of cork from a wine bottle under a microscope, or a little slice of it under a microscope, and saw what he thought were little rooms or cells of um, a religious organization or of, of a, uh, a prison. And that's what he, he, why he came up with the word cells. We now know that cork is wood and comes from plants, and plant cells are more rigid and have that more square-like structure. So you could tell students that story um, through your discussion or through a read aloud. Um, the fifth principle is to require, to teach to and re to require really clear and concise explanations of your students. And this can be done in writing, especially when they're older, or even just orally through your question and answer flow in your class, especially with younger students. So here are a couple of examples of how this might get scaffolded from fifth grade to seventh grade to high school with the same concept. So the mitochondria, mitochondrion or multiple mitochondria are really important parts of the cell. And oftentimes students learn a definition such as the mitochondrion is the powerhouse of the cell. Well, that's a very basic definition and doesn't really tell you exactly what the mitochondrion does. So at a fifth grade and then even seventh grade ex example, might, a better explanation might be something like the mitochondria release energy from the cell. That's a short definition for students, but it also gives you a very clear explanation of what the mitochondria do. When students get into high school and they really have to focus more on the mitochondria for several different cellular processes, such as photosynthesis or respiration, then you might require something like the mitochondria are the sites of cellular respiration, where the cell breaks down small glucose molecules into ATP. That's the type of definition that you'd find in a high school book, but isn't something that you want to require of a fifth or sixth grade student. The sixth principle is to perform demonstrations and labs or other teacher-led activities that are going to supplement your um, instruction. Um, we will be talking more about these kind of one-on-one, -on -one, um, and there are several different examples of these on um, Box, um, our file sharing system, but just a couple of different principles to keep in mind when you're performing demonstrations and labs. First, definitely don't think that a classical education means that you don't do hands-on activities. We definitely want the students to be doing science. One of the challenges or recommendations that I have for a first-year teacher is to try to do one lab demo activity, something that's not just the students listening to you or engaging in discussion, just one per unit. For most of you, that's five to seven in an entire school year. And you can definitely do more, but they do take preparation and time, and you have a lot of different classes that you're preparing for. But getting yourself more comfortable with doing science with your students um, will be very beneficial, and you'll find that the students really can grasp the concepts even more by engaging with the material. One of the resources that we have on Box that we recommend you read over is called our um, Projects in the Classical School or a project-based learning white paper that goes into a little bit more detail philosophically about um, what the place is of projects in a school. But here are a couple, again, of examples in, um, anchored in something like parts of the cell. And maybe many of you have done this yourself as a teacher or had to do this as a student or maybe even had to do it with your own children. But one common example is to have students make a cell model out of candy or other materials. And this can be very fun for the kids, but it takes a lot of time, usually at home, and then students may or may not fully understand why they picked the materials that they did. Um, a good way to do this is to have students complete some sort of a model in which then they have to explain why did they use the materials that they did. Um, I might recommend, though, that this is even uh, better if done with some class time where teachers are able to help the students put something together. But oftentimes the typical example that you will see is just some instruction sheet being sent home and the parents have to help this child put the model together and then the students bring it in and it just sits on the shelf. 
So if, you're, if you would like students to make a model of anything in science, um, you want to give them clear instructions and have them explain why they picked the substances that they did to accurately reflect the model that they're putting together. I would say maybe a, a, a better thing to do is to have students actually engage with cells. And so you can view prepared slides, um, microscope slides that can be very inexpensively ordered from a biological company, or just images of electron micrographs, so pictures from under a microscope, and have students, through question and answer with you, identify the organelles, or even in pairs and filling out um, a, a, a table in which they're being scientists, making observations, and identifying um, that's that organelle for you. Um, and that can be done, again, with images, even if you don't have access to microscopes. Um, as your school grows and is able to obtain some more science equipment, especially as your school expands into the upper grades, we really encourage schools to have those upper grades share those materials with elementary teachers. So, and to build relationships uh, across the faculty and with the students. So maybe some ninth grade biology students can work with a fifth grade class on using the microscopes. Maybe the fifth grade teacher students get to go to the ninth grade biology class and look at specimens under a microscope. It's very easy to do things like make onion skin slides where you just um, slice a very thin layer of an onion and you, uh, you don't even need that high power of a microscope to be able to view the onion cells under a microscope. Um, with a lot of adult supervision and um, proper hy hygienic um, practices, you can swab um, the inside of, of a student's cheek and look at skin cells under a microscope. If you have even a retention pond outside your school, just small drops of the pond water um, will allow students to see algae and other um, protists under a microscope. Again, and students can just identify the organelles. They might not even have to write anything down, but just being able to see the organelles and explain their process um, will help them fully understand the material that you've already taught them. Um, finally, uh, my last principle is to ask really excellent questions. And we've talked a little bit about this in, in some of the previous principles. But again, using um, an example from, from fifth grade. Say you've taught all of the organelles. The students have the definitions in their notes. You've done a lot of back and forth with them, so they've mastered the, the organelles. They've seen some images. And you want to help make some connections from the cellular level to the more macro, the animal or plant level. So I might start by asking um, the, the, a student, um, what is the function of a vacuole? Hopefully, by towards the end of the unit, most of the kids can tell me that a vacuole is the storage unit of, um, or storage organelle of a plant cell, oftentimes is holding water. And then I might seemingly seem like I'm jumping um, to a different topic, but asking them, well, why do plants wilt? And students will probably know that plants wilt because they are lacking water. And then I might ask, well, what is happening with a plant cell when leaves are wilting? Or, in other words, what organelle is affected? And they might start to connect that the vacuole doesn't have enough water. So what would happen to that organelle, to that vacuole, when you water the plant? Well, the vacuole is going to fill with water. It's going to expand, and it's going to push on that cell wall and allow those leaves to perk up, which is what we see. A couple of just ways that you can ask really good questions of your students in class and how you can use those questions in different ways. You might use choral response. So that first question, what is the job of a vacuole? That would be great for a choral response. And I know that choral response is used a lot with your literacy and orthography lessons, but they can also be used in other subject areas like science. They're really good for short definitions, for vocabulary words, and for names of people. Um, they help keep the whole class together when they all have to answer together. And most of the time this is used for elementary students, but I've oftentimes found that with older students, if you see that they're drifting off a little bit or you need to pull them all back together, you can do some choral response with them and then kind of ease back off because they, they don't really like it very often, but it gets them back with you and then you can move on into more of a discussion style.
Another way of asking questions is through cold calling or random calling. Um, one thing that this does is kind of keep students on their toes so nobody can hide in your class if they know that they can be called on you at any time. But I would caution you that you should first really get to know your kids before you do this because you don't want to just um, pick on a kid who you know is probably going to maybe struggle with the material a little bit. So if you, w once you get to know your kids and their abilities and their confidence in your classroom, you might save those kind of easier questions such as what is a vacuole for your quieter kids or your strugglers where you can call on them and they maybe didn't raise their hand but they'll know the right answer and they'll feel more confident. And then you can save those more application style questions or those questions that stretch kids for those stronger students who you know can help kind of spur the discussion and continue um, the conversation to a deeper level. Um, just a, a couple little tidbits with this. If you have students who don't know the answer, you want to establish a culture in your classroom of, of it's okay to not know the answer, but that I don't know isn't necessarily acceptable. So when a student doesn't know, you can ask them some more questions or help guide them to their textbook or their book in order to find the answer. Or maybe they're still just struggling and so you go on to another student to help them out, but always come back to that first student and give him another chance or another question uh, so that everybody can be fully engaged in the class. Um, that's all that I have for you today about how to make a great science lesson in your classroom. And um, I am always available for you to contact me with any questions. Thank you.